The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Simplifying the Complicated, an algorithmic guide for clinical decision-making in HR-positive HER2-negative early and metastatic breast cancer. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash KBV 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about simplifying a very complicated algorithm around high-risk hormone receptor, both early and metastatic breast cancer. I'm Erica Hamilton. I lead the Breast Cancer Research Program at Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm joined by two other uh, faculty, uh, Dr. Javeri. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here joining both of you esteemed faculty members and friends and colleagues here. Uh, so I'm a breast medical oncologist from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And Professor Johnson. Hello, I'm Stephen Johnson. I'm a medical oncologist at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London and head of the breast unit here. We are all very happy to uh, join you guys today. So three large goals for us to really talk about knowledge and understanding of the key data on CDK4-6 inhibitors as uh, multiple settings, both early and late disease, to equip you with skills to individualize treatment for your patients that have hormone receptor positive disease, and to really get into some of the sequencing questions uh, that are facing us in clinic now. And third, to enhance the best practices for team collaboration, helping our patients in terms of adherence and persistence on therapies and managing our side effects. So what are the current gaps and opportunities for improvement? So one, uh, there has been recent suggestion that there may be some differences in CDK4-6 inhibitors, and this is still up for debate, uh, but we want to explore the data in both metastatic as well as early breast cancer here. Also talk about the increasing evidence of use of CDK4-6 inhibitors in the adjuvant setting, uh, where we have uh, one such approved drug and another drug with uh, positive data, and how are we going to select uh, patients that are high enough risk to justify these treatments. And then third, uh, talk about the combination of endocrine therapy and CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line setting, why we may see some of these differences in overall survival and practically what we're doing in the clinic from day to day. So let's talk about if there are really differences between the CDK4-6 inhibitors or are all of the three CDK4-6 inhibitors that are currently approved really created equal? So preclinically, when we looked at preclinical data sets, while palvociclib and ribociclib both have high selectivity for the CDK4 and CDK6 kinases, in preclinical data set, it appears that ribociclib has a higher CDK4 to CDK6 inhibition ratio. And when we look at abemaciclib, that has a different chemical structure and really exhibits the highest inhibitory effect on the CDK4-6, but also has an impact beyond CDK4 and 6 on other multiple kinases, including CDK1, CDK2, CDK9. And this might really explain the differences in the toxicity profile when we review those amongst the three CDK4-6 inhibitors. But the question is, is the differences in the CDK kinases that we see across these agents really going to translate into differences in clinical uh, data sets that we review? What about clinical differences that we have seen uh, across the clinical trials for these three agents? I think the one big difference that we see is abemaciclib is really dosed continuously, which is distinct from what we do with ribociclib and palvociclib, both of which are administered intermittently. So those are three weeks on, one week off regimens, but abemaciclib is actually uh, continuous daily of a 28-day cycle. Ribociclib is the only CDK4-6 inhibitor that was really tested in a phase 3 study, the Mona Lisa 7 study, which was dedicated for our pre- and perimenopausal women. Abemaciclib has penetration through the blood-brain barrier and is the only CDK4-6 inhibitor that was tested in hormone receptor-positive brain metastases patients where it demonstrated a 24% clinical benefit. It is also the only CDK4-6 inhibitor that was approved as a single agent based on the results of the Monarch 1 in pretreated hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And as we said, because of the differences in the cyclin kinase inhibitions between the three agents, we do see a difference in the toxicity profile. So when we think about palvociclib and ribociclib, we're thinking more hematologic toxicity. When we're thinking about abemaciclib, 
with predominantly thinking gastrointestinal toxicity, less hematologic toxicity. Both the bemisoclip and ribosoclip also have liver toxicities that can happen, so one has to monitor the liver function when we initiate patients with these medications. And ribosoclip can prolong QTC intervals, which is why we require EKG monitoring in the first two cycles when we start patients with ribosoclip. What we have seen across randomized controlled trials in the metastatic setting, that despite these slight distinct differences between these drugs, the primary endpoint of progression-free survival was near identical for all three agents with near identical hazard ratios. And we'll review these data shortly. So I may direct uh, this question to Dr. Johnston first. You know, do you think that there are real differences among the CDK4-6 inhibitors, or do you think as a class they're really performing quite similar? Well, I think there certainly are differences in terms of their toxicity profiles, and that's why we have to have the different schedules because of the hematological toxicity needing the intermittent scheduling, and the GI toxicity can, can be managed by continuous dosing. But the clinical evidence is different in different settings because in metastatic disease, all three drugs seem to work very well, as we'll see uh, in the later data. But in early breast cancer, we've started to see differences. And this begs the question as to whether continuous dosing versus intermittent dosing is different in a setting of microscopic cells in an adjuvant setting versus established disease in the metastatic. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Javeri, anything to add there? No, I think, yeah, I think it's not very clear how the differences that we see preclinically or the scheduling differences or the toxicity differences really can explain, you know, the delta that we might potentially see in the in the early state setting, right? I mean, we have Natalie, we'll discuss that with ribocyclib, which is intermittent dosing. We have abemocyclib, which is already a full continuous dosing, and then we don't have albocyclib in the early state. So, yeah, it, it has not been very clear as to why. And one could be the scheduled reasons, but we don't necessarily understand it very well. Absolutely. So let's move <clears throat> to talking about assessing risk for our patients and also helping patients through adherence and persistence to their therapies. So this is a downloadable uh, practice aid. Um, and this is going to be part of this educational activity. Uh, we'll go through the evidence, and then we'll discuss the practical recommendations first, and then we're going to come back to this algorithm and walk through it a bit when we're finished. This will be available for you to download. And to all of you in the audience, please take a moment to answer this baseline polling question before we start the early breast cancer section. So let's think a little bit about adjuvant therapy in early breast cancer. We've known for many years that for hormone receptor positive disease, endocrine therapy works. These overview data show the clear benefit of five years of tamoxifen compared to no therapy at all in terms of a 44% reduction in risk of recurrence and an improvement in mortality. But in patients with lymph node positive disease, we've traditionally given chemotherapy. Yes, it may not work in all patients with ER positive breast cancer. The Rx bonded data, for example, in node positive disease shows that with low or intermediate oncotype recurrence scores, the treatment is of no benefit chemotherapy in postmenopausal women, it may be of some marginal benefit in premenopausal women. So despite endocrine therapy with tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors and also chemotherapy, a certain number of patients still have a high level of residual risk. And the question in terms of research has been how can we identify those patients and moreover what additional therapies can we give them to mitigate and reduce their risk. So I'm going to discuss the Monarch E trial, which was designed about six or seven years ago now to address this problem in node positive early stage breast cancer. And cohort one, which was the majority of patients in the trial, were those with either four or more lymph nodes, or if one to three lymph nodes, an additional risk factor of either grade three disease or a large tumor size. And these are clinical pathological features that we can all work out in our tumor boards which we know historically have been associated with increased risks of recurrence. There was a second smaller cohort of patients with intermediate clinical pathological features, one to three nodes, smaller tumor size, grade one or two, where the only risk factor was a high proliferation, key 67 of more than 20%. But key 67 was measured as a marker in all of the patients within the trial. When patients had completed their standard of care therapy, with chemotherapy and radiation treatment, 
they were randomized to either endocrine therapy alone or endocrine therapy plus abemocyclib for two years. And by and large, patients were going to be offered endocrine therapies for up to 10 years, as though they, they were high-risk patients. Primary endpoint was invasive disease-free survival. Now, we've seen recent data published from this latest analysis, which now gives us data through to five years. And this is really important now to establish what the benefit is and the prolonged benefit even after completion of the two years of abemocyclib therapy. So the median follow-up in the latest analysis of this trial is now 54 months, and all patients have completed their abemocyclib. The Kaplan-Meier curves demonstrate a very clear and significant benefit for the addition of abemocyclib. What you can see is that the patients in the control arm do have a high risk of recurrence, such that at five years, nearly a quarter of the patients have already relapsed, despite chemotherapy being given in over 95% of these patients. But the addition of abemocyclib shows a magnitude of improvement that appears to increase year on year, even after completion of treatment, this so-called carryover effect. So there's an improvement of now 7.6% above by the, the control arm by the addition of abemocyclib. Now, there are benefits seen in all of the predefined subgroups, so you can't identify a group that has a lower or greater degree of benefit. And these are the pre-specified groups based on menopausal status, nodal burden, tumor size, etc. So all groups appear to derive benefit. It's important also to look at what's called distant relapse-free survival, and that is the prevention of metastatic disease. Uh, or death for any cause. And again, a similar 32% reduction in risk of recurrence of these events was seen by the addition of abemocyclib. Now, at the moment, we've always wanted to know, do these impacts have an improvement in overall survival? And in early breast cancer, hormone-positive breast cancer, survival takes a long time to follow up because of the long natural history of the disease. At the moment, the data remain immature, but there are numerically fewer deaths in the abemocyclib arm, 208, compared to 234 in the endocrine-treated alone arm. And what you can see is that this is a series of events that occur over time, and there's a histogram here that demonstrates this in each of the analyses of the trial in 21, 22, and 23. And there are the patients, the deaths not related to breast cancer relate, uh, appear to be very similar, but deaths due to breast cancer, as time goes on, appear to be less with the addition of the abemocyclib. But more importantly, the green bars show that there are patients alive with metastatic disease still being treated who have not yet died, and there are half as many in the abemocyclib arm compared to the control arm. So with further follow-up, we anticipate that survival will continue to mature over time. Now, it's important to understand in older patients where we might have concerns about the adverse effects of the drug as to whether they derive benefit as well. And analyses have shown in patients either less than 65 or more than 65, the hazard ratios in terms of the degree of benefit of the drug appear to be the same. Dose holds and dose reductions, however, are an important consideration in the management of patients on abemocyclib. And we understand that it's important to make these adjustments so that patients can tolerate and manage the adverse events. And in the trial, 26, uh, there were 66% of patients who had to have a dose hold and 40% of patients who had a subsequent dose reduction. And the most common reason for dose reduction was the most frequent adverse event diarrhea. But I've always said it's important to make sure you find the dose that is right for the patient, because it's the ability to stay on the drug that's important, rather than making sure that they have the maximum dose that is prescribed. And subsequently, analyses have shown that the importance of this is manifest in the ability to stay on the drug. And patients who do discontinue the drug, and there were only 17% of patients in the trial who came off the drug, the risk factors were primarily either older patients, patients who had more existing comorbidities, or poorer performance status. And if patients are able to have a dose reduction, they are more likely to be able to stay on the drug. 
So data have shown that if you've had up to two dose reductions, over 86% of the patients can stay on for at least six months or more. And in terms of whether that has a negative impact or not on the outcome, kaplan meier curves have shown very clearly that even if you have a dose reduction, there is no reduction in the benefit of the drug. So the hazard ratios in terms of prevention of cancer recurrence are identical in patients, even if they have to have a dose reduction. And this is a very important clinical point for us to understand with our patients that it doesn't matter what dose you end up on, it's the ability to stay on the dose that is really the most important thing. So in terms of regulatory approval, based on the Monarchy trial and the latest data from the trial, we have approval both in the United States, in all of patients within cohort one, regardless of key 67 status, You'll recall that initially the drug was approved only for those with a high key 67 but the analysis of the trial is very clear now that the benefit is seen regardless of what your key 67 score is. And the similar approval in Europe is seen for these patients. And we can identify them easily in the clinic based on their clinical pathological features of four or more nodes or of one to three nodes, either a large tumor size or grade three disease. So I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Kajavari, to now discuss the other big adjuvant study, um, which is the Natalie trial with ribocyclib. Thank you, Dr. Johnston. So Natalie is evaluating adjuvant ribocyclib. And while we were focusing on our high-risk patient population at Monarch E, as Dr. Johnston really beautifully summarized for us, which was predominantly your four or more positive nodes or high-risk features if they were, you know, one to three positive nodes. The patient population that was enrolled in Natalie expanded beyond that high-risk patient population to even include some stage two and node-negative patients. In fact, for the stage 2A patients that were node-negative, they could be eligible if they were either grade three or with grade two and evidence of some high-risk feature. And this high-risk feature could have been in a key 67 of 20% or higher, or an oncotype DX uh, recurrent score of 26 or higher, or any other high risk via other genomic risk profile and scores. Or they could be stage two that were N1 stage two. Stage two and stage three patients that were node negative were also eligible. And these patients were then randomized to receiving ribocyclib, and in this case, for three years at 400 milligrams per day, three weeks on, one week off. So just a reminder, when we think about ribocyclib in the metastatic setting, the dose that we utilize in the metastatic setting is 600 milligrams three weeks on at one week off. And there was a trial that was conducted in the metastatic setting called the AMLI trial, which certainly evaluated differences between the 400 milligram dosing and the 600 milligram dosing. And while that study did not necessarily meet its primary endpoint, which was overall response rate, what we did learn from that study was that the rates of QTC prolongation were lower at the 400 milligram per day dosing. And so this was the dose that was chosen here. And the idea was to see if a three-year duration would be uh, something that we could uh, see better benefit with at a lower dose of 400 milligram, which was still thought to be very um, optimal based on the efficacy we saw and what the toxicity profile looks like. These patients obviously were randomized along with a non steroidal AI and gocetolin, we do not uh, use tamoxifen with ribocyclic given the higher risk of QTC prolongation. And then the control arm was non steroidal AIs with gocetolin uh, if they were uh, premenopausal. So these were 5,100 patients. The primary endpoint here was invasive disease free survival. And key secondary endpoints are listed here on the slide. And here are the results for the primary endpoint. At a median follow up of 27.7 months, there was a statistically significant improvement in the IDFS, three-year IDFS rates favoring the ribocyclib arm, an improvement from 87% in the control arm to 90.4% in the ribocyclib arm. The hazard ratio here is 0.748, which was statistically significant with a p-value of 0.0014. So the absolute IDFS benefit with the addition of ribocyclib at three years was 3.3%. And their patients who are still ongoing and remain on therapy and follow-up is being continued for these patients. This was the final uh, invasive disease-free survival rate uh, that was presented. Again, a statistically significant improvement here. In this case, it's maintained here. You see that um, 
the control arm, the three-year IDFS rate was 87.6%, and it was 90.7% in the ribocyclic arm. Hazard ratio is similar, 0.749. So what about distant disease-free survival? So in Monarchy, we looked at distant recurrence-free survival. Here we have distant disease-free survival. And again, similar to uh, invasive disease-free survival, we did see an absolute benefit with the addition of ribocyclic even for distant disease fee survival, here the delta is 2.7% at three years. So an improvement from 90.2% to 92.9% has a ratio of 0.749. Overall survival data remain immature. So this is just a median follow-up of 35.9 months at this final analysis and we do require a longer term follow-up to be able to comment on the overall survival benefit with adjuvant ribocyclic. So what did we see with the safety profile with the 400 milligram dose in the adjuvant setting in Natalie? So certainly there were no adverse events or clinically relevant adverse events that increased more than 1%. And only 0.8% increase in discontinuations was observed in the updated analyses that we uh, saw the results for. So the most common toxicity remains neutropenia and grade three neutropenia rates were slightly lower at this dose at 44.3%. Febrile neutropenia rates, as we know, with these drugs are very, very low. In this case, it was only 0.3%. What we do see is liver-related adverse events. And so any great liver-related adverse events, despite the 400 milligram dose, was 26.4%. And grade 3 or higher was 8.6%. The rates of QTC prolongation, however, were lower, with any great QTC prolongation in the ribocyclic arm of 5.3% and 1% of grade 3 or higher. The most frequent reason for ribocyclic discontinuation was, in fact, liver-related adverse events. And so just putting evidence into perspective, when we think about both of these uh, trials that we now have uh, data for, one, we had an approved medication of amacyclib is already approved. Um, and Natalie, we have the data for ribocyclib. We know the differences in terms of the dosing. Again, abemacyclib is continuous dosing. We have ribocyclib at intermittent dosing. Slightly distinct in terms of the dose that we use in Natalie, it is 400 milligrams compared to the metastatic setting. The duration of therapy is different between the two drugs as well. It was two years for adjuvant abemacyclib in Monarchy, and we have three years in Natalie. And eligibility criteria are broader for the Natalie patient population, which expands beyond to load negative and stage two patients as well with some high-risk features as summarized on this slide. So let's go to a case briefly. This is a 53-year-old postmenopausal uh, woman. She presented with a symptomatic um, mass in her right breast. It was five centimeters, had suspicious axillary adenopathy, biopsy returned strongly ERPR positive and HER2 negative with the lymph node involved as well. Staging uh, was negative. Germline BRCA testing uh, also was wild type. She ended up having 5.3 centimeters of grade three invasive lobular carcinoma with two out of three involved nodes, received uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. So obviously, you know, I think we could all agree that this uh, lady is high risk. Um, she certainly had a large tumor. It was high grade. It involved lymph nodes. And I think that this is very interesting. This is survey uh, data from our patients um, from living beyond breast cancer, as well as GRASP and peer view. Um, asking the question, if you've been diagnosed with early breast cancer, do you feel like your cancer team discussed risk of uh, recurrence uh, with you? And you see that most people are saying yes, and it helped my understanding. Uh, about one in five patients are saying yes, uh, but I really didn't understand. And 16% saying no, or I don't remember. That conversation really doesn't stand out to me. So I think that this is important for us, really, just when we uh, talk about, you know, patients making decisions that are right for them in the adjuvant setting with endocrine therapy based on risk, is that they have to understand what their risk really is. And we certainly don't want to scare patients, but particularly with ER positive breast cancer, the risk continues to go up in terms of relapse every year. So, Dr. Javeri, I'll come to you first. Uh, with this patient, would you offer adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor? Uh, and um, how would you choose? Yeah, so I think I would definitely offer this patient uh, an adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor. Given all the high-risk features that you were very uh, nicely summarized from the case here, the high um, grade, the tumor size, the lymph node involvement, 
and really she would fit very well in the monarchy criteria if you think about it and and would be eligible uh, or would have been eligible for the trial and so certainly at this point when we have a club approved uh, that is what i would choose if driver's clip was also approved i would still think that i would have chosen a clip for this patient i think we do need longer follow-up with the natalie data the median follow-up that we have currently is about you know 27 to 30 months we have more mature data for the high-risk patient population from monarchy with an absolute benefit, which is 7.6%, as Dr. Johnston summarized. So I do think that I would have still chosen a bemacyclic for this patient. Certainly, if diarrhea became a big issue or tolerance became a big, a big issue and the patient just couldn't tolerate a bemacyclic, I'd be very comfortable rolling it over to ribocyclic for that reason. Well, I think that is a great lead in to the next question. Dr. Johnston, let's assume that this patient does uh, receive a bemacyclic and that they have diarrhea, they just don't feel great on treatment. How are you approaching uh, the adverse event of diarrhea, but also discussions about adherence and how safe are dose reductions and perceived benefit with dose reductions? No, this is this is very important. An education up front to, to the patient about the adverse events, how to manage them is really the key to keeping patients uh, on therapy. So I make sure that they are prescribed loperamide with their first cycle of abemacyclib. And they know that if it's going to come on, it's often within the first one to two weeks. And it's often short-lived of a matter of a few days. And if despite loperamide and we give them clear instructions on the doses to use, then it's important to stop the drug, allow the adverse event to recover, and then to dose reduce if necessary. And the data we now have on the efficacy of patients who are dose reduced showing the same level of benefit are very reassuring to say to the patient, you're not going to lose benefit by having to go on to a lower dose. And it's the ability to stay on the drug that gives you the benefit. And that prompt education, close connection with the clinical team and the nurse specialists as well, allows the patient to feel supported and allows them to make the changes. And in the trial, only 5% had to come off the drug because they couldn't manage the diarrhea, but not all of those patients had had an appropriate dose reduction. So I think we now know how to manage that, and clinicians have got much more experience on how to talk to their patients and to make the changes to allow them to stay on therapy. I completely agree. And I think that sometimes we are underutilizing dose reduction. I thought that one of the telling things about monarchy was that actually half of the patients discontinued did so without ever trying a dose reduction. So, you know, clearly uh, I'm, I'm starting to talk to more of my patients about a dose reduction is possible if you're not tolerating to try to decrease that chance that they just stop the drug and don't tell us about it. So we were going to come back to our algorithm here, and this is obviously very complicated because, uh, of course, uh, managing patients with hormone receptor positive early breast cancer is complicated. But you can follow along in this diagram really on the bottom, patients that have no positive disease, so a little higher risk on the top, no negative, and then split down by menopausal status, premenopausal or postmenopausal, and what their genomic risk is. You can see that certainly age comes into play here. Uh, that for um, patients that are postmenopausal, there's many more of them, uh, even with higher, say, uh, genomic risk scores such as oncotype, et cetera, that can be spared chemotherapy. But you also see some of these characteristics on the bottom right of the slide of how to qualify for adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor. And please remember that these are downloadable for your use. At the end of this section, please take a moment to answer a follow-up polling question and tell us what you think and what you would recommend. We're now going to be moving on to hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer, talking more about individualizing our choice of CDK4-6 inhibitor and the very timely and important issue about sequencing. So again, we're going to be presenting an algorithm here, uh, and we'll be coming back to uh, discuss this. I think our first line treatment is obviously much more clear than the second line, our patients are receiving CDK4-6 inhibitor uh, with combination of endocrine therapy. Most of the time, uh, this is an aromatase inhibitor, but for select circumstances could be something like fulvestrant. And then in the second line setting, there is a lot of alterations we're specifically look for uh, to predict benefit to certain drugs in our arsenal, uh, as well as even uh, genomic testing. And then we'll also get into uh, antibody drug conjugates a bit towards the end.
At this point, take a moment to answer our other baseline polling uh, question about metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer and share what your thoughts are. So when we think about first line disease for ER positive breast cancer, there are a number of trials of the CDK inhibitors, which broadly speaking, all show the same degree of benefit. So the Paloma trials looked at palbociclib, the Mona Lisa trials, Mona Lisa 2 and Mona Lisa 3, ribocyclib. Mona Lisa 3 was with fulvestrant and included some first line as well as second line patients. While Monarch 3 was the study of, a, of abemocyclib with an aromatase inhibitor. You can see the size of the tumor of the studies and the hazard ratios were broadly speaking all very similar. And on average, it improved the median progression-free survival from the order of around about 10 to 14 months to 25 to 28 months. And that was a big change that we hadn't seen with any other additional therapy to endocrine treatment in the first-line setting for many decades. So this allowed all three drugs to become standard of care options in this setting. If we look now at the updated data, in particular the impact on overall survival, we now have enough maturity in these trials to see what the impact of the drug on improving survival in the first-line metastatic setting is. As far as Mona Lisa 2 is concerned, there was a significant reduction uh, or improvement in overall survival, hazard ratio of 0.76, with the median moving from 51 to uh, nearly 64 months. As far as the Paloma 2 trial was concerned, this unfortunately did not show a significant improvement in overall survival for reasons that are not entirely clear. In the intent to treat population, there was no difference in the median overall survival. And part of this reason was due to data not being fully collected in all of the patients. And therefore, if they excluded patients where they didn't have survival data, they saw a trend, but still not significantly different for the addition of palbociclib. And it's been unclear why in this particular trial, the survival signal was not seen. However, there are real world data with palbociclib that have shown very clearly outside a trial setting that the addition of palbociclib to an aromatase inhibitor significantly improves survival compared to using an aromatase inhibitor alone. So it may be just the vagaries of that particular trial where they were unable to demonstrate the signal within that study. As far as abemocyclib is concerned, we have data for overall survival from the Monarch 3 trial, which was a randomized two to one study of the addition of abemocyclib to an astrazole or letrozole compared to a placebo control arm. Now, there have been several analyses of survival and the latest analysis was done on a data cut in September 2023 with a median follow-up now of eight months. So this, uh, of eight years, sorry. So this study is now very mature. And at the first analysis, the interim analysis that sh was showed significance, we saw again the median moving from 54 to 67 months with a hazard ratio of 0.754. It wasn't statistically significant because the alpha was split between the intent to treat population and also the population with visceral disease. So this final overall survival analysis was presented recently at the San Antonio meeting. The median again shows a numerical difference from 53 to 66 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.804. Again, statistical significance was not met because of the split alpha, but possibly also because of the two to one randomization and the size of the trial. However, most clinicians feel that this was still clinically a shift in survival for a cohort of patients who were clearly deriving benefit from a bemocyclip. The trial did a sub-planned analysis in patients who had visceral disease, where clearly the CDK inhibitors are really important, and we have now moved to this being standard of care compared to using chemotherapy. Again, from a number of trials that have shown that CDK inhibitors are better than chemotherapy in that situation. And again, you can see that for those with visceral disease, the median overall survival was numerically improved. The latest data for the, for the um, uh, progression-free survival demonstrate the very significant benefit of the drug in delaying the disease progression. And this is manifest also in the delay in when, until the patients need chemotherapy, which is an important consideration for many patients in this setting. 
It's important when looking at overall survival in these studies, however, to think about what further therapies the patients had in sequence, because we know that if you give a CDK inhibitor in a second line setting, if patients haven't received it in the first line setting, it has an impact on overall survival. So one of the concerns was that maybe in these trials, more patients in the control arm were then getting rescued by having a CDK inhibitor in the second line setting, which would impact on the survival. So knowing if there was an imbalance of treatments between the different arms of patients when they completed the trial would be important. And certainly in Monarch 3, there were more patients then having targeted therapy in from the control arm in the second line setting. And that may or may not have had an impact on whether overall survival of using the drug in the first line setting was actually statistically seen. But either which way, these drugs have a clear impact on controlling the disease for longer, almost certainly having an impact on survival. And I think to some extent, the biggest impact will be in the first line, but equally it can have a clear impact in the second line setting. So if we look at the trials where survival signals were seen in Mona Lisa 2 and in Monarch 3, the quantum of difference is around about the same, namely a gain of a median of a year, um, going from 51 to up to 64 or 67 months, which again is a very significant progress in the management of this form of breast cancer. Thank you for uh, leading us through that data. So I guess the question is, is does the overall survival or lack of overall survival influence your decision of CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line setting? Dr. Johnson, what are, what are you currently doing now? So I think, as we saw from the, the, the initial progression-free survival data, all three drugs work. All three drugs significantly improve the chances of the cancer responding when combined to endocrine therapy compared to endocrine therapy alone. And yet they have differences in their overall survival and differences in their tolerability profile. The evidence is very good that in endocrine resistant disease or patients with concerning features of visceral disease, certainly abemocyclib data appear to be very strong. The data in younger patients, particularly Mona Lisa 7, which I didn't show there for in combination with ovarian suppression for rivocyclib are likewise very strong. And palbocyclib is a well-tolerated drug, and in, often in my older patients, I think palbocyclib is an excellent option to use. So I use all three drugs in first-line setting and differentiate basically on what I think the tolerability would be, the differences between pre- and postmenopausal data, where the data with ribocyclib are very strong in premenopausal patients, and the data in visceral disease and concerning features, where abemocyclib has a very strong role as well. And increasingly, it will also be important if these drugs have been used in the adjuvant setting, whether we then, what drug we use when we come to the metastatic setting, provided there's a period of time off since completion of their prior um, adjuvant treatment. So I think there is a role for all three drugs, and I'm not too concerned about the overall differences in survival between the different trials, because the clinical benefit in terms of progression-free survival and benefit is very similar across the board. Fantastic. I think we've, uh, you know, covered a lot of this information uh, in terms of Dr. Johnston talking about younger age uh, and premenopausal status and the specific data we have around ribocyclob there. I certainly think that ribocyclob in terms of QTC interval can be harder to combine, particularly in our older patients that may have a lot of cardiac meds or things that make that a little bit trickier. And so that's a unique population that sometimes uh, I, I might go towards something like palbocyclib uh, for ease of combination there. Um, I don't think we have a whole lot of difference that, uh, you know, these behave different in visceral disease, et cetera, or um, items such as that. So again, uh, here is our algorithm. We've really covered a first line data here with the CDK4-6 inhibitors. Please uh, answer this follow-up polling question about first line treatment for hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And we're going to be moving to toxicity management for a bit now. So I think we've covered some of this uh, in a higher level in terms of differences in adverse event profiles. We know that in terms of side effects, our palbocyclib and ribocyclib are a little bit more similar. Uh, they certainly have uh, the most common side effect being neutropenia. Um, this really is upwards of around 60% in terms of grade 3-4 neutropenia. 
We often talk about a bimicycle of not having the side effect, and it's not that it does not lower white blood cell count. It's just that our grade three, four tends to be about half uh, as frequent or a little bit less, but certainly we still do see count drops. I think this can uh, be practically useful in patients that have a low white blood cell count at baseline. I have a few uh, African-American patients that just have a normal uh, blood count that is quite low for them. Uh, but can be a challenge with CDK4-6 inhibitors. So that's another factor that sometimes can influence our decision. Uh, we don't see a ton of uh, GI side effects in terms of nausea and diarrhea. Certainly, if we do see these, uh, it tends to be uh, much more mild. And then again, uh, also highlighted here that ribocyclob is the one that we can see QTC alterations, um, but this really uh, is uh, relatively infrequent. When we talk about uh, impact of abemocyclob adverse events on uh, PFS, this really was looking at dosing. Uh, you can see uh, abemocyclob here in Monarch 2 at the top, uh, Monarch 3 at the bottom, and looking at two uh, dosing levels. And it looks like for those patients that have to dose reduce, they uh, still see benefit and the same benefit than those patients that don't. I often get the question of, well, can we just dose everyone to begin with? And I don't feel quite comfortable with that. I think that's really a different question. The reality is, is that the dosing of these drugs are flat dose for everyone, regardless of uh, body size, regardless of PK parameters and how they may be metabolizing that. And so I think dose reducing because if somebody has a side effect or their counts are low or they're proving to you that the amount of medication that they're on is a little bit too much feels quite different to me than just dose reducing everyone uh, out of the gate as some people do tolerate full dose quite well. So in terms of diarrhea, I think we've all become quite uh, comfortable with this, uh, certainly across tyrosine kinase inhibitors and antibody drug conjugates and even CDK4-6 inhibitors that we see diarrhea with some of our uh, drugs. I typically uh, start with loperamide. Um, you know, I think what's important to remember about diarrhea, that grade 2 uh, diarrhea, uh, even grade 2, can be quite bothersome for a patient. Imagine six stools above baseline. This really is limiting in your comfort uh, sitting uh, in a carpool line, for example, or uh, going on long trips. So I think it's important uh, really to talk to our patients about this and how to uh, best manage it. I agree with Dr. Johnson that if somebody's struggling with diarrhea, yeah, we certainly can help with medications. But typically my first recommendation is just stop the drug. We'll get the medications figured out and restart the drug. But the only patients that I've ever had uh, that have gotten into trouble didn't stop the drug um, to get uh, a handle around this. We certainly are pretty good in terms of hematologic uh, adverse events. Um, I think we've gotten pretty comfortable with seeing these low white blood cell counts. Remember that it's very rare for this to translate to any febrile neutropenia. Normally, this is an asymptomatic laboratory finding, uh, and we do have these algorithms in terms of adverse events available uh, for you to download as well. And so let's go into a little bit of discussion. Uh, Dr. Javeri, how do you educate your patients around these potential adverse events? On one hand, we want our patients to be very well informed, but if we start reading to them kind of all of this that can happen, it can also seem quite overwhelming. So how do you handle this in your clinic? I think, I think you know, I really focus on highlighting the key side effects that we really think that are going to be bothersome for these patients. For example, if we're thinking about a MSCLIB and we're thinking about diarrhea, that's the one I really want to talk to the patients about. So I educate them about how this might happen more so in the first one or two months. It's not necessarily something that we see as a late side effect. You know, what kind of dietary modifications they could think about. And more importantly, how important it is to communicate back to the clinical team. Because the point you were raising about the Monarch E data, where patients discontinued without dose reductions, is really, really key. You want these patients to be able to communicate back to the team about their experience so that we can actually guide them as to when to hold, when to dose reduce, and then stay on that drug. Because as, as Dr. Johnson was saying, you can't derive benefit unless you stay on therapy. So it doesn't matter what dose ultimately it would be as long as you can stay on that therapy. So I think talking to them about the key side effects and kind of preparing them that that could be happening early on. It's very important to talk to us about it so that we can guide them and it's easily manageable. It's something that we can really help them with is how I have been counseling my patients. And that has seemed to be working very well in my practice. That's fantastic. A quick question to you, Dr. Johnson. How do you have your whole care team help you? Do you do patient callbacks? Do you do handouts? Um, this really kind of is a, a group effort. Um, how, how are you handling this? 
Yeah, I think we've had to to modify our clinics and, and the interaction. We have our, our clinical nurse specialists who will counsel the patients. I think the key thing is to make sure that the patients contact us back, that they have a phone number that they can ring in. They don't go to their primary care physician with a bit of diarrhea. They actually contact back to their oncology team. And if you have that close interaction with written and, and verbal information and a follow-up call to see that they're doing okay, and make sure they know how to ring in, then you mitigate um, a lot of the anxiety and you actually manage the toxicity much better than waiting, as you say, until it's too bad because the patient didn't want to bother you and they just continued the drug regardlessly. So if you take the effort up front, it makes all the difference. Absolutely. We're going to hand over to Dr. Javeri uh, to talk about options after first line. Thank you. So one of the questions that really comes up is, should we continue CDK4-6 after the patient's tumor has already progressed on a CDK4-6 in the first line setting? Because majority of our patients, if not all, do get CDK4-6 in the first line. Now, this is a, a paradigm that we've been utilizing for our HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer patients. And so the question here was, can we do that for our form one receptor positive with CDK4-6 inhibitors? Now, one of the approaches that this trial took, which is a phase two trial called the MAINTAIN trial, was after patients have had a first-line CDK4-6 inhibitor, no more than one line of chemotherapy, they were then randomized upon progression to switching their endocrine partner and switching the CDK4-6 inhibitor, in this case, to ribocyclic, versus switching just the endocrine therapy partner with placebo. And the primary endpoint here in the 120 patients that were randomized was progression-free survival. And here are the results. When you actually switch both the endocrine therapy partner and the CDK4-6 inhibitor, it did seem like there was an improvement in progression-free survival. The median in the control arm was 2.76. It improved to 5.29 months in the ribocyclic uh, arm. The hazard ratio here is 0.57, which is similar to what we've seen in our first-line metastatic trials as well. This was statistically significant key value. Now, unlike the maintained trial where you switched both the CDK4-6 inhibitor and the endocrine backbone, two trials evaluated the question, what if we continued the same CDK4-6 inhibitor, but just switched the endocrine partner? One of these studies is the PACE trial, and the study design is shown here on this slide, where these were patients who had progression on their endocrine therapy and CDK4-6 in the first-line setting. They were not allowed more than two prior lines of endocrine therapy and no prior fulvestrant. They were allowed to have one prior chemotherapy, no more. And they were then randomized two is to one is to one to receiving full vestrant but continuing palbocyclic or full vestrant alone shown in the green bar. And an interesting triplet with an addition of a checkpoint inhibitor, in this case, a Venumab. And the primary endpoint really was to look at resist confirmed responses for progression free survival for full vestrant palbo versus full vestrant. And unlike what we saw in the maintained trial, we did not see a difference in the continuation of palbociclib by just switching the endocrine partner to full western. The median PFS in the full western palbo arm was 4.6 months, and in the full western alone arm was 4.8 months. While this was not the primary endpoint, it was interesting to look at the, the triplet arm did have a median PFS of 8.1 months. And this is unlike what we have seen with abamaciclib and febrolizumab uh, that was reported out in other trials where there was a lot of toxicity seen. We did not necessarily see a big toxicity safety issue and this interesting safety signal, um, uh, efficacy signal, uh, I apologize, that was seen with this triplet. So I think maybe we might have to look into this furthermore to see why uh, there was a benefit seen with checkpoint inhibition in this patient population. And the second study that also evaluated the same question, can we continue the same CDK4-6 inhibitor and just switch the endocrine partner was the Palmyra trial. And this also looked at uh, patients whose tumors have progressed on palbociclib and then just continued palbociclib, but switched the endocrine partner. So if they had received full western before, they were allowed to get letrozole or vice versa. This was a 2 is to one randomization, again, with the primary endpoint of progression-free survival. And again, you do not see a statistically significant difference with such an approach in the Palmyra trial, similar to what we saw in the PACE trial. What about abamaciclib? So this was a retrospective data set, a multicenter effort, where we did see that patients who had had prior progression 
on palbociclib, when they were re-challenged with abemaciclib, there was an improvement in progression key survival, at least retrospectively. The median progression key survival here was 5.3 months, and overall survival was 17.2 months. And that has led to trials that have uh, been designed to definitively answer this question, and we really uh, eagerly await data from phase three uh, randomized data sets. On your left is the design for the post-monarch trial, where the question was, does abemaciclib plus fulvestrant improve outcomes after adjuvant or first-line CDK4-6 inhibitor plus endocrine therapy? So this would be predominantly your palbociclib, ribociclib in the first-line uh, study. And then on your right is the design for Ember-3, which again asks a similar question, but in this case, the endocrine backbone is a novel oral cert called immunestrant, and there were three arms, one looking at immunestrant alone, Another one was physician choice endocrine therapy, and a third cohort that looked at immunostrian plasivamaciclib. So these data sets will hopefully provide this data more definitively, given that these are larger phase three randomized data sets. And this really brings us to where we are with the current treatment landscape for HR positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. So really, when we started off, we really were utilizing endocrine therapies after we learned that you know, targeting the estrogen receptor itself might be effective for this patient population, but quickly learned that endocrine resistance is inevitable. And that's why our research efforts have really led to approval of three CDK4-6 inhibitors. We now have approval for agents targeting the PI3K AKT mTOR pathway with initial approval for Evrolimus and mTOR inhibitor in 2012, then Alpelacid, which is an alpha-specific PI3K inhibitor in 2019. And more recently, we had approval in November of 23 in the United States for Capiva Certid, the AKT inhibitor. We also have approval for antibody drug conjugates. So when tumors become endocrine refractory, we start treating them with sequential signal agent chemotherapy. And we have approval for her to low tumors with trastuzumab deroxycan and if they've had no more than two lines of chemotherapy. And for pre-treated patients, we have a trope to directive antibody drug conjugate approved as well, sasituzumab covitikia. Last but not the least, we have other novel endocrine agents that are all already approved. So we have a novel SIR that was approved in 2023 called NSS Triant. And this was specifically for patients whose tumors have progressed after exposure to the CDK4-6 inhibitor and harbor an ESR1 mutation. And why do we need these agents? We already have uh, three drugs. We have tamoxifen, we have aromatase inhibitors, we have fulvestrant. But I think one thing that we have recognized is that single-agent fulvestrin post-CDK4-6 inhibitors really does not have uh, a great efficacy profile. It's rather very modest. And there are challenges beyond the toxicity profiles with these three drugs and the pharmacokinetic limitations and the issues that we face with resistance, such as ESR1 mutations, which is why there has been a big effort to study multiple other novel endocrine agents, including Circa, Serum, CRANS, Protax, and the idea here is really, can we down-regulate the estrogen receptor with an agent with an optimal therapeutic index and improved efficacy? So we have one approved and hopefully we'll have many others that might be available for our patients. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Javeri. Complicated topic with a lot of options. So I, I think, you know, it is very interesting. We, we now have a drug linked to ESR1 mutation. We have a drug that's specific to PI3. And then we also now have a drug that's es um, sorry, that's PI3, uh, P10, uh, AKT, uh, as well as PERP inhibitors. So the question is, for our patients that are hormone receptor positive, are you profiling them up front now? Are you profiling them after first-line therapy? How are you handling this? And maybe in terms of tissue versus blood-based testing as well. Dr. Johnston? Yeah, this is a rapidly developing field, and we've got um, new ASCO guidelines coming out on this. Uh, to help us that are just being updated at the moment. And the bottom line is we should certainly be doing this. It is, the, the mutations are often dynamic. So ESR1, for example, is very low in frequency in the first line setting and, and then increases with in frequency with exposure to endocrine therapy. Fixed PI3 kinase mutations are a little bit more static. But both of these account for 30, you know, 30 to 50 percent of the reasons for resistance to endocrine therapy. So certainly in the second line setting, that's when we need to understand it because then it's that's when we're going to potentially be targeting different combinations. And they, 
technology is now very clear that you can do this on ctDNA with high validity and reproducibility. And it's more of a generic summation of what's going on in the body rather than a patient with metastatic disease with multiple sites where we know historically that different clonal mutations will occur in different metastatic sites. So the technology really should now be ctDNA testing for ESL1, for PIK3CA, and then now, as you know, AKT1 mutations or P10 loss uh, are also included in the pathway alterations for the approval of capivercetib, um, which is going to be an important new drug in the second line setting. So I think doing it right up front probably doesn't make a lot of sense unless a patient is relapsing early on their adjuvant endocrine therapy and you're looking for the choice in terms of partner of endocrine agent where an ESR1 mutation will be important in understanding that. But in principle, I think after frontline CDK and AI-based therapy, are a progression at that point, that's when this information is going to be important in making your choices in a logical and scientific way with the therapies we now have available. And ASCO guidelines will, yeah, and the new ASCO guidelines will, will confirm that. There's a new set that's going to come out very shortly. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I, I have traditionally been doing it after first line as well. I think you bring up an important point about those quick relapsers. And in fact, Dr. Javeri's presentation at San Antonio, you know, if we end up with a PI3 approved there in the first line setting, that may alter what we do a little bit as well. Dr. Javeri, are you routinely using CDK after CDK a la maintain? Or um, are you really waiting for more clinical trial uh, data to kind of have that be a standard option? So am I doing it for all? No. Have I done it for an individual patient? Yes. And yes, I am definitively waiting for the prospective phase three larger data sets to be able to then decide uh, if I should really be doing this for patients more broadly. Fantastic. So again, we're back to our treatment algorithm. Uh, we again see in the first line setting that is where our CDK46 uh, is standard. In the second line, we have a variety of different options uh, that truly are personalized to the patient and alterations they may have in their tumor. If we don't see ESR1, an alteration in the PI3, AKT, uh, P10 pathway, or BRCA, we still do have options. We have Everolimus, uh, which uh, no matter how many studies we do, we keep going back to the fact that that drug actually looks pretty good, uh, and we're much better at tolerating uh, and controlling uh, side effects now with the SWISH uh, study. We may also have CDK after CDK options there. And then really, once we feel that a patient uh, is no longer endocrine sensitive and getting a uh, benefit um, out of endocrine therapy for their tumor, uh, we go into antibody drug conjugates of which we have sasituzumab gavotecan, as well as trastuzumab deruxtecan for those patients whose tumor have HER2 low expression. I may uh, leave us with a uh, one 30 second or less thought of what you're most excited about in hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Dr. Javeri? I think we've really come a very long way in ER positive breast cancer. I think now the focus that we are probably going to have to um, divert to is how do we sequence all of these agents and can we sequence them to further optimize outcomes for our patients? What do we do when patients have progression or tumors progress? despite CDK4-6 inhibitors in the adjuvant setting and the timing of that, and how do we think about these tumors and treatments when we use these drugs upfront? So I think I'm looking forward to all the research efforts that we will be putting in place to address these important questions so that we further optimize outcomes for our patients. Great ideas. Dr. Johnson, what about you? Yeah, I think the outcomes we see for patients now are so much better than they were five, 10 years ago with the addition of these new therapies. They've made a tangible and significant difference. And the other thing that's important is that precision medicine now is actually being manifest in clinical practice. We're actually using these technologies to understand the biology of the disease and tailor our treatment. An endocrine monotherapy, which we use successfully for many years, is rarely used these days because it's essentially all about combinations and as Dr. Jabiri said, working out the right sequence of those combinations. Ultimately, we will end up going down with chemotherapy and we have exciting antibody drug conjugates there that have made a difference. But bottom line is patients with metastatic ER positive breast cancer live with their disease with good quality of life now for years and years. And that's a real progress compared to, you know, two decades ago. 
I can't beat that. Thank you, Dr. Javeri, and thank you, Dr. Johnson, as well as all of our viewers for joining us today. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash KBV 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.